Welcome to the Champions Rugby Show with me, James Burridge. Today is all about one of rugby's greatest ever flankers, a man who proves that size really doesn't matter. And it's a try for Neil Back, and that really has brought 20,000 Leicester supporters to their feet. He's won five Premiership titles, two Heineken Champions Cups, and a Rugby World Cup, of course. Never has a hand slap of a rugby ball been so controversial as Munster found out to their cost in 02. He is a rugby legend, 18 years a Tiger, Lions and England. Neil Back is with us on the Champions Rugby Show. Neil, great to have your company. It's an absolute pleasure to join you. Really loved the Heineken Cup. Great memories of some great cup finals. Not always winning, but a great occasion. Exactly. We're going to explore uh, all of that in the next half hour or so. Um, I want you, first of all, to take me back to Welford Road when Leicester were in their prime. A, a, a big European game, whether it was a Saturday three o'clock kickoff, uh, an evening one. Just take me back, paint a picture of the atmosphere when you as a team were huddled together underneath the Crumbie stand in that unbelievably tiny changing room, which is still there. Tell me what the mood is like when you run out onto that pitch. Well, by the time we're in the changing room, all the, the sort of hard work's been done, really, in the training week, um, the tough sessions early on in the week where we get physical, it often spilled over, um, but it never left the field. Um, when we're in that changing room, really, we were sort of honoured and privileged to have like a big support. And that, that was down to basically the fan base built around Barbarians games over Christmas. People had to buy a season ticket to get into that game, and that went through the amateur into the pro era. So we always had a big crowd. Sport is emotional, and having a, a big fan base does help. It shouldn't, you know, if if you were clinical, anything outside of the pitch shouldn't matter, but it it does. And having that support give us that sixteenth man on occasions and and helped us over the line. But you had some intimidating players in that changing room alongside you, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, th there wasn't a real lot of chat in the changing room. We were very precise in what we did. We didn't waste time because, as I've said, you know, all the planning from the coaches and the players would be done during the week. When we got there, it was about getting physically ready um, and, more importantly, mentally ready to take on the challenge because, you know, when you play near the edge then you have to be mentally tough and mentally strong. So walking out of the tunnel in my early days, uh, following Dean Richards out and then latter days, Martin Johnson, the captain, I often stood behind them because I was keen to get out to the pitch and you could sort of feel the hairs on your neck rise as you sort of walked out. And then when the captain, the team emerged, then there was a massive roar, massive cheer and that sort of give you that added bit of energy that was required sometimes to beat some very good teams that travelled to Welford Road. Now, you were one of the fittest players in the game. And I know in, in your autobiography, you've talked about size. It didn't affect you. It didn't matter given, given the success you had. But you were durable too. Can you give us some examples of the kind of the fitness regimes you would put yourself through? Because your body must have got one hell of a battering, Neil. Well, uh Lucky this is just audio. Um, if, it, <laughs> if it was video, it would tell a story, really. Um, I often put my head where the ball was, so got kicked a lot. Um, but in terms of training, you know, yes, I did train hard, but many of my colleagues and fellow players train hard. In terms of the size issue, I never sort of dwelled on that. If you get selected, then you're good enough. If you don't, you're not good enough. So early in my career, you know, it was never a problem at club level. But certainly my journey from England schools, Colts, 21s through to the first team was prevented from progressing as quickly as I would have liked over about a four year period from post 21s before I got my first cap. And during that time, you know, I had great support from obviously Welford Road, all the fans there and, and the media in general, really. Um, and a couple of coaches didn't select me. And, you know, it, it was talked about size no coach ever said that to me if you're not picked if you're not good enough so you've got to make yourself good enough so I suppose I talked earlier about mentality I think I'm, I'm pretty strong there 
and probably needed to be. So I just took myself away. I, I went to experts. I went to the head of sports science at Loughborough University and banged on the door and basically said, look, this is where I am. This is where I want to be. Can you help me? And they did. So they gave me sort of individual S&C program, rehab, prehab, nutrition, four years before the game turned pro. And funnily enough, two years later, I was playing for England. So there's always a way if you're prepared to put in the hard yards. And I was certainly prepared and, and did probably for the majority of my playing career. Um, and that was 17 years all told. And that's reflected in my looks today. <laughs> uh, well, it's fascinating, Neil, when you reflect back on Leicester in their pomp, kind of late 90s, early 2000s, certainly in Europe too. And, and that first final in 97 against Breve, where I think beforehand you really gave a bit of a thrashing to, to lose, I think, on, on route to the, uh, to the final. Um, take me back to, the, to, to that final, to that Champions Cup final in 97, because Despite that performance against Toulouse, you came unstuck against Breve. Yeah, it was a long time ago, but it's very vivid in my mind because we learned a huge lesson. You quite rightly alluded to the semi-final where we beat, you know, one of France's best ever teams in Toulouse in the semi-final. And we, we don't just beat them, we, we smashed them five tries to one, 37-11 from memory. So in the week leading up, to the final against Breve, which was at Cardiff Arms Park back in the day. We had media interest, obviously, um, and lots of cameras there. And I remember a training session at the latter part of that week where players weren't on it. They were messing around. I remember them sort of chucking me up in a line-out. Now, I never jumped in the line-out, obviously. And I didn't feel comfortable and I just didn't feel right. And I, I reflect on that. We weren't right for that game mentally. Um, we were playing Breve in the final and Breve were a sort of mid-range club in France. So we smashed to lose. And I think the squad as a whole, certainly not myself, but I think the squad just felt, you know, we just got to turn up. And after 20 minutes, we were 17 nil down. You know, that was painful. They scored three tries to zilch. We got three penalties, I think, uh, by Lilo, John Liley, fullback kicked those. And we got absolutely battered. And it was, a, it was a hard, hard lesson. It was four years before we got to another final. And obviously that was against Stade Francais in the final. And we used the lessons from that and it never happened again. It, it was a huge learning curve for that group of players, which the following years won four back-to-back premiership titles and back-to-back European Cup at the end of those four years. So it was an important lesson learned by us all. And the referee's whistle has gone for the end of the match. And it's been a thoroughly exciting match. But Breve eventually running out, deserved winner by 28 points to nine because they've scored four splendid tries to none. Their support are absolutely ecstatic. The players are rolling over each other out on the pitch there. Congratulations to each other all round. It has been a tremendous second half performance by Breve. They started strongly, they finished strongly. And even today, I mean, sport is now unbelievably professional and, and I still struggle to understand teams who are complacent. Because they know that, you know, they can be great one week and they can be truly shocking the next. And that would have been one of the biggest club games in their careers. So to, so to think they could just rock up and just it would all take care of itself. I still find as a journo watching it, I find that staggering. Yeah. Do you look do you feel that now looking back on that? Look, we weren't that far off, but at the highest level, if you get to a European Cup final, you know, it's the highest level you can achieve as a club player in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's a massive game. It's as close to playing international football as you get. So, you know, we weren't far off, but at that level, it's small margins. And we weren't at the races. It may be a feel, you can't tell, but lots of things make champion teams. And on that day, I just that one incident, that one episode in that training session, just weren't exactly where we needed to be. But we would never repeat that again. And like I say, that steeled us. Um, like I say, four years to get to another final. But uh, we progressed really quickly. And, and that gave us that steel that we needed to, to perform at the highest level. Well, it was worth the wait, wasn't it? Because that, that final against Stade Francais 
in 2001 was probably one of the best club matches in Europe of that time. And I think it's still talked about fondly now. What was that team like to play in, in 01? Uh, look, we had, a, we had a really gritty pack, front five, like lots of star names in there. We had Grumpy Cockers on the bench as well. Um, <laughs> I don't think he got on in the Stad game, to be honest with you, but he was a big part of that squad. So we had some real sort of hard nuts up front and we had a very talented back line. You know, I know you've interviewed um, Leon Lloyd and he, he was scored a couple of tries in that game. We actually scored three tries in that game. I think there's uh, one try that everyone forgets and that was scored by... Who was that? Um, you. Me. <laughs> uh, but when you I wonder where this I was going. Look, I watched the game because through COVID, through lockdown, they've, they've played a few games and I've seen some games that I've never seen ever because generally, you know, you play your game, you move on to the next game. So I've only watched the World Cup final once um, in 2003. So um, that game, I watched it and we sort of played well. But they, they kicked seven drop goals and three penalties, I think. Something like that. Ridiculous. Dominguez. Yeah, Dominguez like, was amazing. He, he couldn't miss. So, And we were under the pump a bit. But that try, you know, and I'm, I'm not bigging myself up, but it was an important try for the team. It was a team try. It was scored at the right moment. It got us back into the aim and we kicked on from there. Of course, a brilliant by Mr Healy and uh, Leon you know, stole the limelight on that day and had, well, incredible bits of skill, significant moments in the game. But that early try was built through pressure through the whole team playing really well and not failing under pressure. We could have lost our way in that game early on, but, you know, my try was a result of a lot of team pressure and I just had to dab it over from a few yards. But that sort of put us back in the game and, and give us that platform to kick on. I seem to remember Austin was dosed up on painkillers for that match. I think he had a knee injury or something. And yeah. uh, in an interview afterwards, he said, even though when you were down, you never doubted each other as a team, that there was a look and you, you didn't panic. And so many teams would like to love Neil to have that mindset. Yeah. Um, I said earlier, the team didn't really do a lot of talking. You were led by Martin Johnson that didn't say a lot. And it's a lesson to all leaders, really, because a lot of leaders say a lot of things and it just becomes white noise. Jono was a master of saying very few words. And often just a look was all you needed. And that, that squad in particular over that period, you know, at some points in the game, it was just a look, you know, and you look to your left, you look to your right, you look to the guy opposite you and you knew you were in a good place and a good team. So... A lot was said. We believed in one another. Um, we put in the hard graft. No one had an easy ride in that team. There was lots of competition for places. Um, if you had a bad game, you're out of the team because you know people were chomping at the bit to get in there. And that kept us right at the top of the game. We sort of trained with the mentality, you know, whatever the game is, if it's a club game, an international game, a British Lions game, you know, World Cup game, as soon as you cross the paint, you play at a high level, you train at a high level. If you do that all the time, then it just becomes norm, that level of performance. It's just normal. If you train at a lower level and expect to get to a higher one, you're going to come unstuck. So we always trained at a higher level, really intense, really punchy at times. There was a fight every week between someone. It kicked off. Why? How did they kick off? They're legendary, the Leicester Tigers, training scraps. Well, look, it, it, we're not being shown, but it's, it's a physical game. And, you know, you need to play right on the edge. And often it spills over, you know, and because we, we train consistently at that level, then, you know, we can control it. It wasn't new to us. We knew where the line was. And like I said, it never went off the field. There was never any handbags off the field. If it kicked off, it, it, it got tasty, but, you know, we just let them get on with it and then have a smile and say, right, you're finished. Let's get on with what we're here to do. So, uh, yeah, Austin's right. A look. And if you've been in that tier environment, you've got trust. You look around and you think you're a good player, good at what you do. And that gives you confidence. You were in the heart of Paris that day. <laughs> um, it was like a home game, wasn't it, really? Well, for them. Yes, for them. Yes, for them. Yeah, we were just up the road. I mean, that goes down. 
you know, very close to winning the World Cup. And I, I don't want to talk about the World Cup because we're, we're on about Europe. And Europe's the Heineken Cup, Champions Cup, whatever you want to call it. It's the highest level you can play as a club player in the Northern Hemisphere. It's the top competition. And as I said, it, it's sort of it's the closest thing to international football you get. And we were playing in their back garden, really. And that goes down for me personally as one of the most memorable days, not just because we won. It was a great team performance. It was a steely performance. It was a composed performance. But post the game, and it would never happen today. I, I don't like using the word never, but I couldn't see it happening today. After the game, we took the trophy over the road into the local bar and had a drink with our fans that were over there. It wouldn't happen today. You know, that, that team understood the support that we had and what extra they gave us, particularly on the road. So that's one of my most memorable moments, really, and one of my favourite games because it was four years having getting battered by Breathe, but coming there and doing the job, and doing it well with great players. Referee's whistle goes for the end of the match, and Leicester have won a pulsating contest by 34 points to 30. And uh, it certainly has been a wonderful advertisement for rugby football. Not as much spectacle as you would hope for, but uh, all the elements of a tremendous battle between two of the great club sides in the world. Austin Healy there is simply overjoyed. Of course, he had such a contribution to make. Darren Garforth as well, who's been around for over a decade. And there, a wonderful scene for Leicester supporters as their team hoist that great European Cup high, and there Dean Richard, no wonder he's thrilled, what a display he's given over the season, because it's such a strain for the coaches, they do all the preparation and then they have to stand at the side and worry and hope that all their preparation comes to fruition, in any event, there you are, a wonderful scene, Leicester, the European champion. Yes, yeah, special memories indeed in Paris, and... The following season, you were doing it all again in Cardiff. And looking back, Neil, you just won in 2002 your fourth Premiership title. So this was Leicester, uh, as I said before, in their pomp. You know, you, you looked and felt many thought you were probably unbeatable. You, were, you, you had this huge physicality. Um, you had a winning streak. But how did you get yourself mentally fresh one week on from winning the Premiership? I think that's just in you. Winning things with friends and teammates is really special. And the overriding feeling when you win something like a European Cup or any major trophy, the overriding feeling is all the effort and sacrifice is worthwhile because to get to that place, there's some pain to be endured and some sacrifice, not only by the players and the management, staff, etc., etc., but family members as well. So that, that's what makes it special. That's why I played, because I set out in life to, to win everything. And thankfully, as a Northern Hemisphere club and international player, we won everything and some things more than once. And in, in winning that final, we were the first to, to win Europe back to back um, and also four championships at club level back to back. It, it was incredible. Dean Richards was in charge there, you know, and he was a big part of that. He was a big part of Leicester as a player. He's a good friend and he's, you know, a very good coach. He, he knew how to get the best out of people because that's the type of player he was. He, he, he worked hard, he trained hard. His warm-up wasn't that flamboyant, to be honest with you. Um, how he went from his warm-up in a changing room to out on the pitch and playing fantastic was beyond me, but each to their own. It, it was an incredible time and we felt top of the world there There's some great players that have been at the club and served the club for a long time it, it was very special to win you know trophies back to back you ended up beating Munster in that final in Cardiff let's talk about the infamous hand of back incident for those who don't know Tigers were leading 15-9 in the last few minutes of the match and then this happened Be careful together. Munster that close yeah. to the Leicester line Stringer puts in now Neil Back seemed to hit that with his hand. It's one against the head, but Stringer went straight to the referee. Leicester get the ball off. I don't see. Please, I don't see. 
And Stringer and his teammates still having a go at Joel Jude. Yes, it was the hand of Neil back. No doubt about it. Do you regret it, Neil? No. Short answer. I'll just lay this out. And I watched that game for the first time ever not so long ago during this COVID lockdown period. It, it, was, a, it was a tough, tough game that. Um, there was lots going on, lots seen and a lot not seen. But in terms of performance, although we went 6-0 down, we had a try disallowed in the first minute. We had a try disallowed in the 10th minute. One for blocking when Freddie went over. Two because the ref said he wasn't ready when their hooker overthrew a line-out and Mike Johnson went over. We, we fought hard um, to get back into that game. You know, we crossed the line four times. You know, two tries were disallowed, two were allowed. I think Stimo converted one and um, we got a penalty. So at 59, when this incident happened in the 78th and a half minute of 80 minutes, so in that previous 78 and a half minutes, they hadn't crossed our line. And even if they won that ball, they wouldn't have crossed our line. So um, the incident itself, it, it wasn't coached. It wasn't practised. It was autonomous. You know, we were five or so yards out from our post defending our line. It was the opposition's put in. And uh, Joel... The, the referee went to the side of the scrum and, and Stringer was a young player. I think he was mid-20s, 24. Just got into the island setup. Obviously went on to win 78 caps and I sort of helped develop him as a player because he learned from that incident. He didn't let it happen again, did he? So, you know, I, I, I look at it and it was one of those things. It It wasn't the reason Leicester won that final and it wasn't the reason that Munster lost that final either. Um, the game's played over 80 minutes. If you want to analyse a game and look at every thing that wasn't quite right, it would take you a while to go through them. And, you know, I, I, I don't have an issue with it, but someone, one of the players, it may have been one of our own players, but kicked me in the head 10 minutes earlier. But no one's talking about that. That was foul play. That was against the rules of the game and it prevented me from continuing a phase of play so you know we might have scored if I'd have not been kicked in the head but I'm not complaining about these things happen um and it was it was autonomous it was there you know I, I sort of joke about it now when I public speak that it was like your grandmother put in an apple pie on the windowsill fresh out of the oven and saying don't touch that. And they walk out the room. You're going to have a, a bit of it. And that's what I did. But, you know, the Munster lads understand the crack. And uh, if it had happened uh, probably any other time in that game, we wouldn't be talking about it now. Let's just round off that 2002 final. Again, another final where Austin Healy had a, a huge impact on it. And he was at 10 for that, left O'Gara for dead and sprinted through. How pivotal it was he? He is, I mean, we talk about maverick rugby players, don't we? And Austin is unique in that sense. He did something for you guys, which was very spur of the moment, very kind of flash Harry, wasn't it? And, and in games which are so tight, you need that type of player, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's like anything. He was a talented footballer. He could play across the back line. In the end, I think that sort of, because he was... You could say great in a number of positions. He wasn't the best in any position. And that, and that's why he wasn't involved in 2003 in the squad. Because, you know, Clive picked the best player in the position and the second best player. And, and Austin just missed out on that. You do need players like that. But, um, look, I'm a, I'm a team player. I've got team values. I, I think everyone in a team is equally important to success. You know, I, I believe strongly that you know, a tight head prop who's developed his strength so he's got a 21-inch neck and the hard work he puts in to do that and the platform he gives us is very special. But we don't talk about that. You know, I could mention many of the other examples, you know, driving, saving tackles, groundwork, turning over balls. We like to talk about, you know, the flashy stuff, but for me, the basics are equally as important. So... Those little flashes 
do make a difference, you know, and they were significant in both finals. Him and uh, Leon Lloyd didn't have perfect games, but they had good games and they made significant inputs at parts of those games. So, yeah, I'm glad they did because they helped us win. But both of those would say without the others, he wouldn't have been given the opportunity to do that. And can I, Neil, just talk about Dino here? Because you alluded to him about five or six minutes ago. He he was the guy at the top. He was your director of rugby. Tell me that, what he did to that Leicester team. What was the Dino imprint on that team? Well, I think um, he was revered as a player, a very good player. You know, he was looked up to, and he led with a firm hand. He was he was firm but fair, and he expected a lot off the players. Probably more than he gave himself as a player. To be honest with you, particularly on the SNC side. But the reason Dino was a good player, because he wasn't incredibly athletic, really. He just understood the game. And often he would be in the right place because he understood the game, not because he was particularly fit. He run good lines and he he was an intelligent footballer. You know, in his day, I mean, he he played in the amateur era. Um, He was incredibly strong um, and pretty powerful. So he didn't mess around and you knew exactly where you stood I, th- I think he was honest and brutally honest and i think people respect that i certainly respect people that are brutally honest um no one's perfect and, and later on he, he, he did make mistakes but you know he he put his hand up and moved on but in terms of success of getting the best out of people dino's up there with, with the best and and that leicester team you know the key players in it were then part of the England team that won the World Cup just a year later. How important do you think it was that players like you played in big moments like that in European domestic finals? And then it therefore it obviously prepared you for when that moment came in Sydney. Yeah, no, I'm a big believer in the mentality. I mean, yes, look, when the game turned pro, it took four, maybe five years for everyone to get up to speed with professional rugby on every front and not a lot has changed since then you know everything that any team's doing now you were doing after five years of the game turn pro so the game turn pro 96 97 four years later five years later 2001 2002 everyone was doing what any professional rugby player today is doing so where there's made a difference is the tech that's come in analyzing opposition specialist coaches but mentality is the most important part and it's about making clear decisions when you're under pressure and the correct decisions. And I think, you know, when you've you've played in big games and win them, it gives you confidence and belief. Um, and, and not only less players, there were some big players from other premiership clubs in that World Cup final squad the following year that had done similar things. They performed at the highest level and and in big games. And it's like I said, it's like alluded to earlier. If you train with the right mentality, every time you go out to the pitch to train, and whether you're playing in front of one man's dog or 100,000 people, then your performance becomes consistently high. Um, so you don't have to raise the bar. And I think that's what Leicester did for a substantial amount of time. The level of performance in any game, home or away, was at a high level. You know, we went out with the attitude, look, you've got to play blooming great to beat us. You know what I mean? And and occasionally teams did do that. They played well and they beat us. And fair play to them. You know, we always played well. So anyone beat us had to play really well to beat us. And can I just ask, of all the players you played against, who was the one you really hated playing? Who was the one who gave you nightmares? I find this really difficult to answer um, because... I went out onto the pitch and I, I don't know how this comes across because I, I don't say it out loud too often. I, I, didn't, I didn't fear anyone. I felt that I was as good or better than anyone I played against. And, and I, I felt I had to have that attitude and that mindset and that mentality. So I didn't fear or hate playing against anyone. I enjoyed crossing the paint with my team and teammates and I, I love winning. And, you know, if I lost, I was grumpy for a few days, um, but then got back into hard work and hopefully would win the next one. So 
I certainly didn't fear playing against anyone. The better the player, the more I wanted to play against them because I wanted to prove them that I was at least equal to them, if not better. You're in that rare group of people who have actually made a convincing tackle on Jonah Lomu. So, <laughs> Neil, the, you, your, your tackle actually one. sent him backwards. More, more than one. More than one. And, and, that's, and that's what I saw, saw the other day. I think there was a game. I think it was... I only caught the highlight, I think it was on social media the other day, but uh, it was a tackle where he sidestepped me, but I took him low to the right, and then uh, Hilly come over the top, Richard Hill come over the top. Um, but there was a more impressive one than that. He, he literally ran at me, and I thought, right, tackling anyone, including the Joan Lomo, is about technique, doing the right S&C, and then having the right mindset. It doesn't matter how big or, or small they are. Quite often, the smaller player is more tricky. I'd rather Joan Lomi run at me than Jason Robinson. Jason Robinson's 5 for 8 and 80 kilograms, but he's got, like, serious feet. So, no, I quite enjoy watching myself, a wee man, tackling Joan Lomi and knocking him backwards. Good stuff. Yes. It's a, well, well done, because uh, Mike Cat could certainly have done with uh, listening to your... Uh, your technique on how to <laughs> tackle Jane Lomu. Um He's not alone. You know, him and him as I was, I was at that semi final 95 when Jonah scored a hat trick in the first half and went on to score four tries, running over, well, handing off Will Carling, um, scooting round both the underwoods and then using Mike Cat as a speed bump. <laughs> Just to finish with, Neil, you've obviously coached with Leicester, you've coached elsewhere as well. And with your coaching hat on, you would have seen what is happening to your current team at Welford Road, um, the team that you love uh, so much. And they don't look particularly close currently to emulating your success, but they have obviously changed a lot with Steve Borthwick coming back and helping out Jordan Murphy. How long do you think Tigers fans are going to have to wait for a piece of European silverware? Right. I think that finally... Leicester are being honest about where they are and because of that they're now able to sit and think well this is where we are where do we want to be and that is back winning and winning consistently against the best sides in the world um, in order to do that you've got to have a plan so I think before they weren't honest about where they were they sort of celebrated finishing in, in the top four and getting into the playoffs Oh, we've got into the playoffs. I think they did it 13 years on the run. But it's about winning. It's about winning the blooming thing, not getting into playoffs. And I think it was a bit of a proverbial, oh, we've got into the playoffs. Oof, take a breath. You might as well finish last if you don't win it. So first and foremost, they're honest about where they are. And they've not been honest about where they are for a long time. They're honest about where they are. It's easy for everyone to see where they are. And now they've got a plan of how they're going to get back there. I think Borthwick as a coach will make a difference. And an issue has been recruitment. I think we're beginning to address that. And then it's about creating the right environment. And so I think Geordie is a great young coach. I think he should hold his position at Leicester Tigers. The recruitment it's been good. There's some gritty players to come up front because we we look like we might have a pack that can compete. Everyone in rugby knows if you haven't got a pack that can compete, it doesn't matter what backs you've got, the platform's not going to be there. So it's going to take time. And I think before we're winning the Premiership or European titles, we're looking at three to five years. But the fans at Leicester are incredibly important and they've just got to stick with the team and help them get back to the top because it's not been good viewing over the last couple of seasons in particular. But the problem hasn't just arrived over the last couple of seasons. It's been here for a number of years now. And like I said, we were celebrating success and it wasn't necessarily about winning. So hopefully times will change and, and Mr Borthwick and co will make a difference and certainly the players and now arriving at Leicester and hopefully we'll know what's expected and they'll give the effort required to compete at the top of the table. Neil, it's been fascinating listening to this 
so much insight from your European success and towards the end, I think some really interesting uh, views there on what Leicester have to do to get back to the top of the European tree. Thanks so much indeed for joining us on the Champions Rugby Show. My pleasure. Well, what a treat that was uh, hearing from Neil back, particularly on those two back-to-back finals in Paris and Cardiff, getting his verdict on what it was like to be led by Martin Johnson. Please subscribe to our Champions Rugby Show podcast via your favourite podcast provider. And if you've liked what you've heard, remember to leave us a review. We'll be speaking to another European legend shortly. But until then, it's goodbye. Goodbye.